Hi everyone, we have a great panel today to talk about you know, just what the current state of South Asian health is in the US and what we want it to look like in the next couple of years. Um, so I'm going to introduce our panelists and I'll start off with Dr. Ashwin Basan, uh, Ashwin Basan, who is the current commissioner of the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. Dr. Basan is an esteemed primary care physician, epidemiologist, and public health expert. His efforts are dedicated to enhancing the well-being and social welfare of marginalized populations on local, national, and global scales. Dr. Basan also serves as a faculty member at Columbia University, where he teaches um, at the Mammon School of Public Health and the College of Physicians and Surgeons. In addition, he continues to provide primary care as an internist at New York Presbyterian Hospital at Columbia University Irving Medical Center. Uh, he's also the former president and CEO of Fountain House, which is a national nonprofit organization devoted to mental health. Um, and Dr. Basan had led initiatives that expanded the organization's impact um, and budget. He championed the implementation of telehealth and digital mental health programs and spearheaded the establishment of national policy uh, in Washington, D.C., focused on crisis response services and the quality of community-based mental health services. Um, next, we have Dr. Mina <coughs> Seshmani, who is the director for the Center for Medicare. She has a diverse background as a healthcare executive, health uh, economist, and physician and health policy expert, which has given her a unique perspective on how health policy impacts the real lives of patients. She also most recently served as vice president of clinical care transformation and MedStar Health. Um, she also provides direct patient care, uh, most recently as a professor of otolaryngology, head and neck surgery at the Georgetown University School of Medicine, um, and she brings decades of policy experience to her role, uh, most recently serving on the leadership of the Biden-Harris Transition HHS Agency Review Team. Um, she has spent many years uh, you know, implementing different strategies, uh, as well as implementation of the Affordable Care Act across the HHS department. Uh, <coughs> Next, we have Dr. Sage Alhaki, who is the White House Senior Policy Advisor for Public Health. She is a distinguished healthcare executive, physician, and entrepreneur, and brings rich experience and expertise to her current role. She actively shapes behavioral and public health policies within the Domestic Policy Council, and with successful ventures in founding and leading impactful global social enterprises, she has empowered over 30,000 young women in impoverished regions across six continents. In 2013, she was appointed to the UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon's advisor group, where she evaluated global progress in maternal and child health care. During the pandemic, she also provided direct care to patients as a resident physician at MassGen Hospital. And then beyond clinical duties, she also has initiated uh, educational and mobilization campaigns at Harvard Med School to promote voter engagement among healthcare providers and patients. Um, and last, we have Dr. Elsa Kenea, who is the professor of medicine at UCSF and a principal investigator of the Masala study. Um, she specializes in cardiovascular disease and its prevention. With a profound understanding of this field, she's emerged as a prominent advocate for increased access to COVID-19 vaccines and equitable distribution among diverse populations. She, um, the Masala study, which she's the principal investigator for, focuses on South Asian community researching health disparities in the cardiovascular and type 2 diabetes field within the South Asian immigration population. Um, through her contributions and her passionate advocacy, she has played a vital role in promoting health equity and improving the well-being of individuals within South Asian communities and beyond. So thank you all for being here today. So as we uh, start off the panel, we want to talk about you know, what the next 100 years are going to look like. Um, so if all of you can take a couple of minutes just to talk about what you think the biggest healthcare inequity or access challenge is going to be that needs immediate attention and should be established as a foremost priority on the South Asian health agenda. Uh, we can start with Ashwin. Very good. Okay, this is working. Good. Good to see everyone here. Thank you for having us. Thank you, Samira. Thank you to everyone at Impact. Um, I was saying to Mina that this might be the least attended session of the <laughs> this political conference, but I'm glad to see that there's some interest in in public health. And and frankly, we're at a time when health and public health is, is ha has more eyeballs and interest and news clips than it's ever had. And, and one, of the thing I, one of the things I talk about to my team often is we don't want to go back to a time when we were an afterthought. We want to capitalize on this moment and really use it as an inflection point for transforming public health systems, investing in the public health workforce, integrating mental and physical health 
Um, so when you're talking about some of the challenges for the next hundred years, that's a lot of what I think about, is how do we strengthen the foundations of our systems? How do we strengthen the links between prevention and care systems through better data, through uh, better payment, um, which I know Nina is leading at Medicare. But for the South Asian community in particular, um, I think a lot about the impact of diet-related disease. You know, uh, we're on track to spend um, something on the order of 50% of our healthcare spending on the burden of diet-related diseases, diabetes, hypertension, high, high cholesterol, stroke, and all of its complications. Um, and that just, to me, feels like a very unsustainable path. It's unsustainable for us as a country. It's unsustainable for us as a community. Um, and it's really time for our community to really address that. We have some very unique risk factors um, in our biology, in our, in our genetics, that put us at higher risk for diet-related diseases. All the more reason we should be at the leading edge of change and of awareness. Um, and protecting each other. Ultimately, this is about changing the food systems in which we uh, consume, changing purchasing patterns, changing uh, cultural awareness, ensuring that the foods around us um, are much more uh, plant-forward, culturally sensitive, um, and economically affordable, right? While many of us are lucky enough to be able to purchase the foods that we want, there are a lot of South Asians, especially in my city, New York, in, in the borough of Queens in particular, one of the most diverse boroughs and, and uh, areas in the country, where you've got a lot of low-income South Asian communities that don't have uh, the sort of choice in terms of their um, diet and um, lifestyle. So I think a lot about what are we going to do from a policy, regulatory, care delivery, and education and cultural awareness perspective to raise up the impact of diet-related diseases and food system transformation. Okay, this is all, okay. Um, I completely agree with everything that um, Ashwin said, and in some ways, you know, as he mentioned, I'm approaching this from, you know, that payment side where Medicare is the largest payer in the country, and we are not gonna be able to do all the things that we all collectively want to do to improve care for our communities. You know, addressing disparities and advancing health equity so everyone has a fair and just opportunity to attain their optimal health. Um, to expanding access to care. Having innovation really drive high quality, you know, whole person care. If we aren't bridging across traditional healthcare payment with care in the communities, and I think that comes to one of the big challenges for South Asian health of really addressing the cultural and community aspects of care. And I think Ashwin touched on one example of it with diet, you know, diabetes, heart disease being more prevalent, you know, in South Asian populations, and the diets are different, the approaches to life are different. You know, how many of you either personally or had a family member, right? where cholesterol is high and they're like, oh, eat a Mediterranean diet with plenty of fish and you're a vegetarian, right? And just as an example where I think there's a lot that still needs to be done to really incorporate those aspects into the care that is being provided for people so that it can actually care for people in ways that reaches out to them. And the other example that I would give is behavioral health where I think you know there are there have been stigma with behavioral health and accessing care and also even just realizing when people need care and I think that's especially prevalent in South Asian communities and another area where it's very important that we all engage where we can work together to really support each other and bring forward those barriers to people who are working in health systems, working in the policy arena, working in the community, to really break those silos down and break those barriers down so that everyone can you know, achieve their optimal health. Thanks, Nina and Ashwin, and good to be with all of you today. I want to echo and affirm what my two colleagues here have already noted, and that is the tremendous disparities in healthcare outcomes and access amongst, amongst South Asian Americans. 
South Asian Americans are up to seven times, uh, my colleague Alka here will correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong, but up to seven times more likely than their white counterparts to experience type 2 diabetes. They're up to three times as likely to experience heart-related chest pain and heart attacks as their white Americans. And when they do sustain heart attacks, despite paradoxically the higher representation of South Asian Americans among our healthcare workforce. And while there are certain, there, there are research studies preeminent among, among them, the now 13 year running Masala study that Alka will further elaborate across the country that are elucidating the causes, the risk factors for these disorders. The truth is there has been comparatively little attention, research and investment in, in why these disparities have persisted among our community. In the federal government, we're working to change some of this. Last year, speaking of mental health, we launched a National Center for Excellence for Asian American Mental Health that is uh, funding and disseminating research into mental health outcomes and access. And um, on the Hill, we saw that Representative Jayapal and 32 other co-founders last year introduced a bill that would invest $5 million into research for South Asian American health. But this is not enough. And what I hope for the next 100 years, 10 years, five years, one year, is that finally we will be able to identify, invest in scale interventions that bring closer to us culturally competent care, linguistically appropriate care, and disaggregated data for South Asian health outcomes. And I hope all of you will join us on that journey and we'll continue to discuss what is needed there during this session. Well, thank you all for being here and spending some time with us and uh, really nice to meet everybody on the panel. Um, yeah, so for me, my our approach, our team's approach is really um, in figuring out the evidence, like why is there more diabetes? If I asked you to raise your hand here, I think most people, why, why, why don't we do this? Show of hands, how many people have a family member who has diabetes? Yeah, and how many people have a family member who has had heart disease at an early age? That means less than age 50 for a man or less than age 60 for a woman. Yeah, and these, and I, I see about 90% of hands went up for diabetes and about 50% of hands went up for a heart disease. This is unusual, and this is what our um, study has been highlighting, is like not only is there high prevalence, we mentioned some numbers, but the, the stark reality is that since the U.S. has been collecting mortality data that can now be disaggregated, um, the numbers of people dying of heart attack has been going down in every single race, ethnic community across the United States. Japanese Americans, white Americans, black Americans, Latino, everybody, except numbers are going up, up, up since the last decade in Asian, Indian, and other South Asian Americans. That is really disheartening because if it tells you something, it's that uh, the messages aren't getting across, uh, there are there is much more work to be done, and so my my view of the next hundred years is really understanding the cultural levers that can be pushed to change this and to really move in that direction towards health equity because because we can't sustain the numbers we're seeing now. Right. Thank you. You've all brought up wonderful topics that we are going to be covering through the rest of the panel. Um, and so one of the you know, things that we discussed was that there are a lot of factors that lead to developing heart disease and diabetes. And so uh, Alka, your work with the Masala study has spent a lot of time looking into these factors. Would you be able to summarize some of the key findings and also let us know where do you think we need additional research? Yeah, thank you. Um, so key findings are, yes, there are some genetic factors. Uh, I'll should mention that uh, we can't choose our genes, unfortunately. Um, so the genetic factors are uh, that there are some uh, reasons why South Asians tend to store fat in all the wrong places. So you may not appear to be overweight or obese, but there is fat in the liver. There's fat around the visceral uh, abdominal organs. There's fat in the muscle. There's fat around the heart. That you don't see in most other communities, but you see it a lot in South Asians, and that's genetically determined. 
Uh, other things that are genetically determined are LP little a. It's a special type of lipoprotein that appears to be really driving a lot of risk that is genetically determined. So you can't, we can't, we don't have medicines to change that. But the good news is that what we found in our study is that there are so many modifiable risk factors. And that is the glass half full version of this uh, story is we can do so much about change in our genetic predisposition because the genes only really account for maybe 15 to 20% of the risk. 80% is in our control. And yes, a lot of it comes down to social determinants that we can't fully control because if you don't have the, the health care, you don't have the ability to afford your medications or to afford healthy, nutritious foods because of the, uh, the food systems are so flipped in this country that, that you uh, end up eating you know, cheap sources of foods that are not nutritious and promote uh, obesity, that is a problem. But the other, you know, big things that are in our control are exercise, are our um, levels of attention to our own mental health. We've seen that mental health is actually an independent risk factor for heart disease. Um, we uh, seen exercise being abysmally low in a very highly educated and affluent Asian Indian community in the United States. Why is that? Why, why is the exercise low? These things are in our control. Diet is in our control, but needs to be culturally moderated and uh, modulated to you know, suit the, the taste and, and the vegetarianism or whatever, whatever other cultural beliefs you exist in. So those are some of the main risk factors and reasons. And was there a second part to your question? Uh, just where additional research do you think yeah. you needed? Yeah, so what about the health of second generation South Asians? When I look around this conference, I see a lot of uh, older South Asians sitting here, but I do see some second generation South Asians. How are they doing in terms of their health risks? Are they actually acculturating as other immigrant groups have acculturated where the longer you live in the US, the third and fourth generations actually are a lot worse health status than their parents? Is that what's going to happen? Because then that's uh, a disaster. Uh, or are they actually improving? So that we're putting some attention into the second generation now. Interventions. Bottom line, we need more interventions that are culturally tailored and that are feasible and accessible and show effectiveness. There's been two to three small intervention studies that have all shown no effectiveness. Mm -hmm. And that is really disappointing And because those are done by people who are very invested in the South Asian you know, adaptation to, to making lifestyle changes. And what that tells me is that some of the disease we have starts in childhood and starts in young adolescent years. So I think we need to shift our focus in interventions into children, young adults, women before they become pregnant and during pregnancy, because that is all priming the pump for who develops diabetes and heart disease. We're starting too late when we're starting in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. Great, thank you. And so based off of all the research that's been done so far, how do we transit this then into policy, both at the state level and the federal level, and different outreaches that we can do as at a government level? Um, so I, Lena, do you want to go first, please? Sure. I think, you know, for, for us in the Medicare program, you know, we we really are looking at where we where we can use our levers to really drive change in how care is delivered. So, you know, for example, as we've been talking about um, being able to think about the cultural aspects of care and the more holistic needs that people have, you know, where we are expanding language access. Um, you know, we we had a request for information on how community health workers and community caregivers can become part of the care process making sure that preventive screenings are covered with people not having to pay anything out of their pocket, right? Where are there those barriers that are preventing people from getting the care they need? And how can we better, how can we better identify what those needs are and be more effective in addressing them through more team-based models of care? And we're also really pushing um, more holistic care models where people come together physicians, hospitals, um, social workers, psychologists, you know, community health workers to really deliver care for a community and for a population in a way that makes sense for people, bringing care to you know, where, where they are. So we have established these new models and are really trying to drive more involvement and engagement in them both 
for you know healthcare providers and for people who are looking to be cared for as a whole person and not as someone who comes in for a specific episode of care because there's a specific diagnosis code and we're just going to talk about that because that's what I can bill for you know in my claim and so really being able to drive that in partnership with everybody you know on the ground getting their ideas of where there are gaps in care that we can address in this way and I'll be able to talk from and we and partnering at the local level because ultimately I used to lead community health in my prior job and I would say what's the first word in community health community so. yeah that's a good segue because I think once you've hit you know I wear two hats right I'm a practicing primary care physician by the time you're with me and my colleagues in cardiology with an abnormal blood level or an abnormal diagnostic test, we've already missed the boat on prevention, right? Now we're looking into secondary prevention. We're looking into preventing you from having a really bad outcome. But that doesn't necessarily mean we've done a good job, right? That means every, every bad result that I see in clinic is an upstream failure on some point, right? So, so I think a lot about what Nina's talking about in the care system, and it's interesting because Medicare is about 65 and older, right? I'm talking about people in their 20s and 30s before they get into their 40s, and what can we do earlier on? For, for them, it's less of the intervention is in the care delivery system. In fact, people of that age want to spend as little time as possible in my office, right? So what do I do as a primary care doctor? I think about the 23 hours and 30 minutes that my patient or that person in front of me is out in the world. What are they exposed to? What do they have access to? How do they make the choices they make? How does their mental health actually impact their choices, right? How does their in unwillingness or stigma or, you know, lack of cultural um, acceptance of mental health actually prevent them from taking some of those choices of healthier diet, more activity? Um, and then, of course, what are they exposed to in their community? What, what kind of food choices do they have? Is it easy? Is it easy to make the healthy choice? So from a public health department perspective, I think about that on two fronts. One is community partnerships. Community health workers can be a lifeblood, not only if they're attached to clinical programs, but if they're actually grounded in community programs. Community programs that might have nothing to do specifically with health, but might have to do with opportunity or socialization or, or economic development in a particular community. But sec second to that, I also look at what is the role of population-based prevention strategies. What does that mean? Calorie labeling, salt labeling, sugar labeling. We just submitted a letter to um, Bob Califf, the FDA commissioner, to advocate for sugar labeling, right? To actually bring that conversation back. We've had conversations. And you know New York City has always led on these issues, right? We've tried trans fat bans. We've tried to ban sugar-sweetened beverages. We were out ahead on calorie labeling. So there's more we can do to actually use behavioral science, use um, nudges to actually help people make the smart choice. I had a friend say to me, you know, I used to get my coffee at Starbucks every morning and I would get some mocha, frappa, whatever thing, right? And this is a relatively healthy guy, active. And then we started labeling it, you know, 1500 calories or 12 calories. And he's like, I stopped. And it's, these small nudges are really, really important. And, we can't get away from the power of public health to really transform systems, because it is quite a powerful tool. Thank you. And so, Ashwin, you talk a lot about you know, calorie counting and really focusing on the nutrition aspect of food that we eat. And Nina, you had brought up earlier about you know, being more culturally sensitive. So how do we incorporate the two together? I mean, how, like, when you have people cooking biryani, for example, how do you label the calories on that? And how do we translate this into the community so that they understand what this means? Um, it's a really hard question. I'll just start and <laughs> kick it over to, to, but you know, in New York City, we have upwards of 50,000 restaurants, right? And we're the most diverse city, one of the most diverse cities uh, in the country. I think we're still the most diverse. Houston is catching up. Um, you know, and so when we put out these guidance, right, when we put out calorie labeling, for instance, or when we contemplated uh, salt labeling some years back, you have to work with every single restaurant. My department is in charge of not only setting standards, but enforcing them, right? So that means going to small businesses, going to communities, going to restaurant associations, trade associations. That includes culturally specific trade associations and business associations 
um, and, and talking to them about how is this going to impact your customer base? Are people going to understand what this means? There's a ton of dissemination and translation and community engagement that comes along with any policy, whether it's coming down from Washington or whether I make it in New York City for 8.8 million people, right? And so that we have to have the ability to build bridges with communities and to be in conversation with them. How does that work? Well, number one, it doesn't work by setting a policy and then doing the community engagement. You have to bring people to the table from the beginning. And so one thing we have done regularly, regularly, is for any big policy, setting up community advisory groups from the inception. And, and what you'll also find is that you learn a lot with very relatively little uh, in, uh, effort, right? Because people are happy to have a seat at the table. They want their voice heard. They'll give you really good information very quickly because they don't want to waste your time. They don't want to waste their time either. And it doesn't take that much. But too often government fails to organize, to engage, and to be in conversation because, I don't know, we're worried about what we're going to hear or we're worried about this slowing down the process. I can tell you, go a little bit slower to go farther when it comes to, to big policy changes like this. Uh, and so, Sigil, you had mentioned earlier that, you know, the incidence of diabetes is definitely higher in South Asians, especially compared to white Americans. It's actually double the rate. So what do we know about this and why, right? If South Asians are integrated into the culture of America, and even though the food, it's, you know, slightly different, but why is it that we have double the rate of diabetes? I think I would defer to my colleague, Alka, here, who's the actual <laughs> researcher to address that, to address that question. Oh, sure. Um, yeah, so uh, there are some genetic uh, reasons, as I mentioned, putting weight or putting fat in all the wrong places. And why does fat end up there? It's because people are consuming too many calories and not putting uh, them out in terms of physical activity or other ways of spending calories, right? And so that's not, it's not that someone is uh, obese to the point where, you know, the scale is with a BMI of over 30, but it's even starting at low BMIs of 20, 22, 23. So this is, you can't get any lower than that. Um, so there are some genetic determinants of why there is so much diabetes. But if you look back to India or uh, Pakistan, like 20, 30 years ago, the rates of diabetes were much, 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 much lower. So there is definitely this acceleration of risk that's happened with globalization, with having, um, I think, you know, the one thing I, I will say in terms of, the, uh, of having 50,000 restaurants in New York, I'm sure about 10,000 are South Asian, is because there are so many places around the U.S. that there are so many South Asians now, um, there's more of this South Asian collective experience of being able to eat the types of food that remind you of home or family, type, uh, shop in those you know grocery stores or markets and have those foods. And the foods that were festival foods, that like samosas that you ate once a month, when your parents and grandparents were growing up are eaten daily. You can buy them at Trader Joe's. You can buy them at your local, you know. And so you're not supposed to be eating biryani every day. You're not supposed to be eating samosas every day. And so there is this realization that because that comfort food reminds you of home or family and it's cultural, that doesn't mean it's a daily cultural thing that people used to do. And so, again, raising awareness about the fact that it's there and it reminds you of home is, is, you know, maybe take that in moderation. What we found in our study is that the more people acculturate to the U.S. Uh, and have more uh, values, norms, beliefs, and, and traditions that they adopt that are Western, the actually the healthier their diet. They're choosing more healthy foods and they're exercising more and they actually have less incident diabetes that develops. So that just tells you that something about the food and the diet and the culture is not very healthy, especially if it's done every day. So, you know, if we did it in moderation, I don't think we would be in the place we are right now. Well, that's great to know. Um, so just shifting it a little bit more to the um, policy aspect. Earlier this year, the Biden-Harris administration capped insulin costs at $35 monthly for Medicare beneficiaries. Um, and similarly in New York, uh, the New York had secured agreements from the largest insulin, uh, insulin manufacturers to cap insulin at $35 for uninsured New Yorkers. So can you tell us about the early and projected impact of these policy and plans um, in place to expand the populations that are served? 
Yeah, I can start from the Medicare standpoint. So the $35 cap, uh, it's for um, a monthly co-payment for a monthly supply of a covered insulin product for people who have uh, prescription drug coverage in Medicare. And that was brought into place with the new drug law, the Inflation Reduction Act, that we implemented on January 1st. And it really is a game changer. You know, before, before I took my role leading Medicare, you know, I was leading care transformation at a large health system and along with community health, I also led our diabetes care management pathway. The number of people who, who could not control their diabetes because they couldn't get their insulin because they couldn't pay for it was really significant. And traveling the country, talking with seniors, this is not just an issue for people with diabetes, it's their family members. You know, there was one woman who um, was giving her brother more than $100 a month for him to be able to get his insulin monthly. And so this really is a game changer in terms of being able to have people access life-saving medications. And it doesn't stop there because to come back to something that's been talked about, someone being on insulin is not the solution to all of our problems, right? It's about taking care of people, preventing things from ever happening, or, and also, Thinking again about someone with diabetes, not just as the diabetes, but thinking about everything else that's going on in their lives and what other conditions do they have and how else can they be supported. And so as we are implementing the various provisions in the drug law, like the negotiation provision, you know, there's going to be a $2,000 out-of-pocket cap overall for an entire year that no one in Medicare would have to pay more um, for drugs. We're, we're implementing these provisions, also thinking about how do we actually make the care better that those drugs are being utilized for? You know, thinking about things like deprescribing and can you, you know, can you get to a place where you're preventing things um, before uh, they need treatment? Hey, how many folks here are from New York or have lived in New York? So there's a famous um, guy who ran for mayor some years ago. Or on the platform of the rent is just too damn high. <laughs> you might recall. Um, drug prices are just too damn high. And insulin is a is a case study in that off patent, been generic for years, but still we find ways to extract higher and higher prices and, and really have very little in the way of consistency. And so what the Biden Harris administration has done is really a game changer and really laid also the platform for what was done in New York to negotiate with the top two manufacturers, Lilly and Sanofi, to cap insulin prices in our in our state. So it's early days, but I expect this to have a really transformative impact, in particular, as Mina mentioned, on the most vulnerable, people on Medicaid or people who are uninsured, right? People who have fallen off of care. Uh, after the end of the public health emergency off of Medicaid and who are now making really serious choices between taking their insulin, paying their rent, buying more nutritious food, paying that gym membership, paying the car payment and all of those things. Because that's honestly what it comes down to at the margins for the people that um, in particular public health is looking to protect. Really the folks who fall through are really fragmented safety net. And so this is a, a huge deal. This is a, a really, really transformative solution. Um, I talk to my residents all the time as I, as I train them, and I say, what's your goal here? They're tweaking insulin, they're adding five units here, they're taking out five units here. But you don't want someone on 40 units of insulin the rest of their life, right? What are the ways we can work over time to spare people, to reduce the burden of insulin need? But you can only get there if you have access. And you can then use a basis of decent control to start making some of the lifestyle changes, the preventive changes. If you, in the process of that, are also sick and having unstable blood sugars and having um, to manage that on your own without knowing whether you're gonna get that long acting or short acting insulin, it's an impossible task. Diabetes is an incredibly hard illness to manage at the best of times. Um, if you have to worry about your paycheck and whether you can um, pay for life-saving drugs, it's, it's nearly impossible. So this is a big deal. I'm really glad about the leadership coming out of Washington and, and in our state as well. If I can 
just to add one more thing, it's and I think this is a theme that you've probably heard, just to put a finer point on it. It's not just about the policies that are being made, but it's about how they get implemented on the ground, right? We put out these policies for $35 insulin copay cap, recommended vaccines at no cost to people on Medicare. Great. 72-year-old grandmother living in whatever town, if she doesn't know that she can go and get her shingles vaccine at no cost, she's not going to go get her shingles vaccine at no cost. And I think this comes back to one of the themes of we as a community need to engage in all of this. We need to take ownership where there are opportunities that our communities can benefit from to get the word out, to support people so that these policies can actually come to life on the ground. Great, thank you. Yeah, it's very important to have the community involved in just translating a lot of these policies into action. Um, so just shifting gears a little bit, in our opening question, uh, the question, we talked about how heart disease and diabetes are both very important to the South Asian community. But in addition to that, mental health is a very big crisis that's happening at the moment, not just in South Asian community, but across the country. But in South Asian, uh, South Asian in particular, there's a very high rate of suicide, which Sejal had brought up earlier. Um, so, Sejal, how can we work collectively to reduce this stigma? Um, because, of course, you know, while the rates are high, there's still the stigma around mental health care. So how do we reduce the stigma? But also, how do we improve access to ensure that there's, you know, culturally sensitive mental health care that's being provided to people? Thanks very much, Samira. And, and I appreciate the kind of dual nature of that question because there is cultural stigma and social stigma, but there's also structural stigma, right? And what that means is the difficulties that we all have and and some disproportionately marginalized communities in, in our country have to accessing affordable and high quality care. And so on the one hand, it's important, as my colleagues have already noted, to, to mobilize as a community and to be vocal that it's okay to feel not okay. It's, it's okay to talk about these issues. It's okay to admit that you're struggling to ask for help. We've tried to do this as an administration uh, through numerous events, by engaging trusted messengers, by um, asking Selena Gomez to come and talk to the First Lady and the Surgeon General about her, her own personal mental health journey. And I'll share for this group myself, I, I too have struggled and my, my introduction to, to public health, my decision to pursue public health and health care as a field was inspired by my own uh, eating disorder and the difficulties that I experienced in accessing care and convincing my parents who are uh, refugees from East Africa, originally from India, that it's okay to seek care, that this is a real health care issue. It's not an issue that lived within my own brain. And so I think that we're starting to see, thankfully, greater acceptance among younger generations about talking about mental health. And, and uh, I think if there is any similar lining to the pandemic over the last couple of years, it has been that it has pushed these issues out into the open uh, and showed us on social media, which is itself a double-edged sword, but in, on social media and other platforms that many of us are struggling. And so simply being uh, able and okay with talking about these issues is the first and perhaps uh, a foundational uh, step. And I think a number of you, uh, many other speakers presenting today and, and influencers are doing uh, just that, and, and we, we welcome and, and appreciate and applaud you for that. Beyond that, I think, as we've already discussed, it's important to advocate, articulate, advocate, advance um, policies that make it easier to access mental health care, from working on mental health parity so that it's not, it's, it's just as easy and, and costs just as much to get an appointment with your therapist as it does to get an appointment with your primary care doctor or with a, you're a, a specialist or cardiologist. Um, it, we also need to advance research uh, that helps us understand why certain populations both struggle with stigma and have higher rates of mental health disorders. There are a lot of things that we can do that we are doing. We're leveraging the 988 suicide hotline that the Biden administration launched last year. 
um, to increase access to life-saving care for people who are in severe emotional or suicidal distress. And we've seen um, in the early data that the South Asian, the Asian American community more broadly has, is taking advantage of this and, and, and is using it more than we anticipated, so that's good news. But I think there's still a lot more that we can do. Uh, and we look forward to, to pursuing uh, those opportunities in the two to six years ahead. Uh, if I could just clear the air, I'm not a cardiologist. I'm a primary care doctor like you. So I'm all about prevention. Um, so one thing I will add is our pipeline of mental health providers for South Asians is dismally low. We have so many MDs and surgeons and all sorts of specialists and cardiologists that are South Asian, but we have almost like tiny, tiny percentages of mental health care professionals like psychologists and LCSWs and all the other um, people who could help with the mental health crisis we're having. And that's really important because going to someone who doesn't understand your cultural context and having to start from ground zero to explain, no, I cannot close the door and have my own privacy in a small apartment I share with three generations. You know, that, that there's just a whole different level of communication and having to establish that with a person that you see and then having fragmented care and going to another person and restarting. So I think, you know, knowing that this is a major gap and that's something that potentially policy can help. I, I just wanted to add, um, I couldn't agree more with both of what's been said by Sejal and Alka, but I think it starts with us, right? Um, I've had a bit of a circuitous journey in my career. I did 10 years in global health, and then shifted domestically, and then most recently led a mental health organization. And many people ask me why. Why did I um, choose to run a mental health nonprofit? Well, a couple of reasons. Uh, one is there clearly the connections between mental and physical health are, are manifest and the same sort of care delivery models and social models and public health and preventive models that um, are effective for managing chronic physical illnesses are very effective for managing chronic behavioral and mental health illnesses and, and substance use issues. But also I lost my uncle to suicide when I was 10. I have family members now who deal with deep mental health issues. And every time I stand up in a place like this or sit in a place like this, I, I talk about it. Because we need more and more of our leaders modeling that. And the impact that that's had on me, the trauma that that inflicted on me and my sister and my uh, family was, and we still feel it today, right? It's okay to talk about it. Not in euphemism, not in... Uh, the ways that my parents spoke of people with mental health challenges, oh, they're, you know, they're troubled or they had challenges or they went away for a while. No, really addressing it head on, bringing this stuff out of the shadows into light and saying, just as Sejal said, it's okay. It starts there. And everyone can do that. If there's one thing you leave here with, I mean, besides all of the diabetes talk, is <laughs> go do that in your daily lives. Go do that in your daily lives. It is healing simply to just talk about it. Every time I talk about it, I feel better. My temperature, my blood pressure goes down, I feel a little less anxious, and it's okay. It's really fine. You can be successful, you can do everything you want in life, and still live with, know people with, deal with, seek help for uh, mental health needs. And that's an, a really critical message. I can't agree more with the second part, which is we have a really broken mental health care system. Mental health care is too hard to access, Regardless of whether you have good insurance, bad insurance, private pay, it, it's just really hard. And that is a part of intergenerational structural stigma that's infected our policy or absence of policy, frankly. Um, and so as you get more comfortable advocating as an individual for your own mental health, for those of your loved ones, get educated about what you need out of the system and demand more. It's only going to come if we demand more from all of us. Um, that's the way that big patient movements, HIV, tuberculosis, I mean, these big global movements for change have been led by people on the ground, and we need many, we need a mass movement for change in mental health. Can I just add on one 
a smaller point, which is just that we often talk about how we need more South Asian healthcare providers and more South Asian mental health care providers specifically, but I don't want that to be considered either a scapegoat or a panacea for this problem writ large, because the reality is we've invested, the Biden-Harris administration has invested hundreds of billions of dollars in expanding and diversifying the mental health workforce pipeline through the American Rescue Plan, the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act, multiple years of congressional appropriations, but you can be culturally competent at providing mental health care and not be South Asian. And so I think it's important to recognize that while we need more South Asian mental health care providers, we also just need richer, more nuanced, better education of our existing mental health care workforce about the unique challenges that afflict the South Asian uh, American population. And then separately, we need a hell of a lot more mental health care providers because we never had enough, we still don't have enough, and we're likely not to have enough despite the billions of dollars invested in growing that pipeline over the next five to 10 years. Make Thanks. mental health care the new cardiologist. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Um, so we don't, we are running out of time, so we aren't able to get to the closing question. Um, but thank you all for, you know, the, your great insight and uh, explaining everything so thoroughly. Um, we just want to bring up uh, our partner. So Alia Bhatia, she's going to just come up and uh, speak a little bit, and then we're going to have Prince come up next. Uh, while she's pulling up just a couple quick slides, uh, my story to the work that I'm going to share, some of the calls to action that was, you know, we could participate in, because we want to make sure that you walk away with this, not just with what you've learned, but what you can do. Uh, my story runs through one of the through lines of the conversation on the stage, which is that in 2019, uh, my mom had a heart attack and it took four days to diagnose it because she was a woman, she was South Asian, she was not. Let me try that, it's much better. Um, my mom had a heart attack. She was, she was a woman, she was South Asian, and she um, is one of those folks who exercises two to four miles per day. She's a doctor herself. It runs in our family, so you could have said, oh, should we have expected it? But she was somebody who was coming back with perfect blood tests, and yet it still happened to her, and there's these elements of understanding what does it look like in our community, and what needs to be different about the way we tackle it within our community that you've heard from folks on the stage. Another thing that was happening in my life in 2019 is I was helping organize in Atlanta, Georgia, where I'm from, uh, doing community organizing, particularly around get out the vote and democracy work. And there was a moment where these two pieces, the things happening in my health life, that my mom was a doctor who went, went through a really severe situation, uh, fortunately recovered, and also this community organizing work fit together into one. And so if you go to the next slide, um, I was in a, a program that required us to learn about our city infrastructure by doing ride-alongs. So we went on police ride-alongs, fire, alarm, fire ride-alongs, and emergency medical services. So I show up in the dead of winter, 2019, for my ride-along with the emergency medical services, and I meet a man named Scott. Scott's gonna take me around Metro Atlanta to see uh, where his EMTs and ambulances uh, are supporting patients in the Metro Atlanta community. He takes one look at me, he sizes me up, and he goes, oh, you're one of those young, idealistic, you know, lead Atlanta people, hop in, let's go for a ride, right? He takes me all around town, and what I see is that his team is responding to some health issues, but they are responding to tons of social issues. Their team is responding to the homelessness in the community. Their team is responding to food insecurity that has suddenly resulted in an emergency situation. They're the ones responding when there's a change in health insurance that impacts whether somebody can afford something like their insulin or other critical medications in their life. And so at the end of this ride along, having established that Scott and I have different politics, we're from different parts of Atlanta, and we are different generations, I ask him, Scott, we have to prioritize here. If I give you a magic wand, you only get to wave it once, and it's going to go away. What do you do? And his answer surprised me. He said, Aaliyah, if I could only change one thing, I wish all my patients would vote. Mm -hmm. If all my patients voted, because what Mina said, community health, the word starts with community, right? It starts with the word community. If all my patients voted, our local elected officials would invest in affordable housing, they'd invest in putting a grocery store in every neighborhood, and when I needed to get people an ambulance, I would have the money to get them one on time. 
It was about a month later, um, if you go to the next slide, that I heard about this organization, Vote ER, that was doing exactly this, helping bring health professionals the tools to make sure that their patients can engage in the democratic process and participate uh, in the election. And in 2020, during uh, the pandemic and the murder of George Floyd, we really engaged tens of thousands of health professionals to get engaged in this and have continued to deepen that work, actually with the support of some of you in this room, um, to really make sure that health professionals, as well as community health centers, hospitals, and people in health policy can make sure that we see this link that saw, Scott saw between our vote and our health outcomes, making sure that our voice is impacting the decisions that are made by our politicians, because we know from global data, the US data, state data, and even at the very hyper-local level, these elections won by a handful of votes, that when a more diverse community of people vote, when we in this room and our communities vote, we see better health outcomes because we see politicians pay more attention to the needs that we bring to the table. And next slide. We also do this work in coalition with a wide array of health and democracy organizations, bringing them together to make sure that we can drive a broader set of changes um, in this work. And on the next slide is a couple really important ones. Um, we've had the opportunity to work with Health and Human Services to make sure that health spaces recognize the place and power that they can hold in supporting their patients to vote. Health spaces know people's actual phone number. They know people's actual address. And you know the name of your health professional, and often you trust them. The data shows that health professionals are among the most trusted professionals in America. So we are helping make it so that our health professionals can be part of the movement that these folks have mentioned to make sure that people are engaged on their vote and are working closely with the folks at HHS to do that. We're also making sure that there's a change in how we think about this link, one more time, sorry. Um, there we go. Between our vote and our health um, at a more, uh, sort of the way we think about this in our consciousness. And last year, the American Medical Association affirmed this link between voting and health, naming voting a determinant of health. And lo and behold, in the fall, on every health ballot measure across the country practically, you saw people vote in favor of their health because they see that link, that when they show up, they can impact their health. And so in closing, just want to make sure that, you know, leaving this panel, you're leaving not only with incredible knowledge, but also things you can do. If you're a health professional, you can go to voteer.org slash kit, get a vote ER badge like the one that I have around my neck, ask your patients around voting. We have tips on our, on our website about how to do this effectively and just wove it into your regular conversations. Um, if you are an organization, you can join Civic Health Month at voteyr.org slash join. Um, and then if you wanna explore something else, reach out to me, my email's there, and um, I wanna actually hand it off to Prince to share another way that our communities can do things together. First off, this was such an amazing panel and such a great talk, so let's give it up for everyone up here. My name is Prince Bojwani. I'm the CEO and co-founder of an organization called Asana Voices, the Alliance of South Asians in North America. Our mission is to build the infrastructure that drives economic, political, and social change for South Asians in North America. You can learn more about it at asanavoices.org. There's a lot of really cool things, but I want to talk about one specific thing that we've been working on that has actually brought me closer to a few of the, the folks on the panel today, which is our Heart Health Initiative. Heart Health is one of the biggest issues that's been brought up multiple times uh, that's impacting South Asians. And I want to play a little game with the audience so that we can learn a little bit more about this. So hold up four fingers, if you can. So right now, these four fingers represent the world's population. Now look at one of your fingers. One out of those four fingers is South Asian. So one out of four people are South Asian. Now we're gonna reset the game. Those four fingers are now all cardiovascular related deaths in the world. Now look at two of those fingers. Two of those fingers are South Asian. If I was a little bit younger, it'd be more appropriate to say the math ain't mathin'. It does not make <laughs> sense. None of this adds up. But we've got great leaders, such as Dr. Olka Kane, who's working towards figuring out what the heck is that exactly going on. Asana Voice is doing three specific things. We're raising awareness on this issue. We're bringing multiple stakeholders to the table so that they can get involved into directly helping this. And then number three, we're um, directing resources towards researchers and, and prevention care. Uh, so the way we're raising awareness is we've got a lot of content that's actually made its way to embassies and consulates all around the world, translated to local languages, and that you can get for free to learn about how heart health is impacted, specifically if you're South Asian. Um, State Department's been a, a huge help there. 
Number two, bringing multiple stakeholders. We've gotten companies like Nike, medical schools like N NYU, to bring you know, South Asian heart health into their core curriculum. Nike's working on getting a cut of their revenue that's uh, from products that are marketed to South Asians to be directed towards uh, local community programs to ensure that they live in a healthier way. And number three, we've created the Save Our Hearts Fund. And Save Our Hearts Fund does two things. Half of it goes towards the Masala study, and it's to, to help you know, fund uh, the research that goes into this. And then number two is we need, uh, we need to direct those resources towards programs that are culturally competent when it comes to uh, tackling and preventing those things. So South Asian Heart Center, if you're from the Bay Area, you've probably heard of it. Um, we, we donate the other half to, uh, to them. So raise your hand if you're gonna leave this knowing that heart health is something that we're all gonna be focusing on. We're probably all gonna run a mile today before the gala. <laughs> I'm, I'm definitely gonna do that. If you wanna help us, go to asanavoices.org. You can send a DM on Instagram to Asana Voices. Uh, and if you wanna learn how you can help, those are two of the best ways. Thank you. Okay.